So today we're doing a class on uh, holding fast. Um, one thing that I do want to make note of is that Tanya is doing a series that starts next week in its biblical womanhood, and Chris is starting a series for biblical manhood. Um, because, you know, Herschel, his last day, what are, what are we at last Sunday, last sermon, you know, is probably the end of the year, January, something like that, not, you know, an exact date. And he told us last week that his schedule is already full through 2024. Well, obviously, she's going to travel a lot with him. I mean, that makes sense. Um, so we're not really sure when she might teach a class again. So um, I just want to, you know, put that little bug in everyone's ear that we definitely would want to participate in that class if you are interested in sitting under her teaching. And like I said, it's biblical womanhood. And I also feel like just in today's culture, it's great to kind of have that reassurance and reminder of what that exactly means so we can also share that with other people. So that's a six-week series that starts next week. So let me just check my phone to make sure that Daniel hasn't sent a message saying he can't hear me. Sorry, just want to make sure. So, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm reading my notes. So if you haven't signed the attendance sheet, just make sure that you do. If you didn't get it, then just get it on the way out. Um, so today I intentionally wore white pants. Um, and maybe someone in this class, you don't have to raise your hand, but maybe someone thought, oh, she's wearing white after Labor Day. Because, you know, like what we do is we hold fast to those things that don't really matter. Um, I am someone that likes to wear white pants after Labor Day. I've just always been that gal, and every single time I will get a minimum of three people that make a comment about it. Like, you're not supposed to wear, you know, whatever it is. Um, another thing is people say, oh, you should wear green on St. Patrick's Day, or I get to pinch you, or whatever. Like, even as adults, don't you all, like, it, you'll catch yourself saying that. Um, another one is, oh, you can't swim for 30 minutes, you know, after, which isn't that ridiculous? Like you do every other activity in life, but they're saying don't swim for 30 minutes um, after you eat. So what's another one that you all have heard? You know, no white pants after Labor Day, uh, green on St. Patrick's Day. Is there another like little... Oh, now that's true. You know, people are very, um, very set in their ways that if you set it up before Thanksgiving, that's a whole different crowd. I'll call them the wrong crowd. <laughs> and then there are the people that are after Thanksgiving people. So, yeah. Who, wait, let's ask. Who sets it up? I feel like you set it up before Thanksgiving based upon your expression. Oh, yeah. yeah. Is it up now? It's like the day after Halloween. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Now, Kelly, I picture you being that person. Yeah. So what we do is like we hold fast to those silly things that don't really matter. They're just like goofy things. And what we do is we repeat them to each other over and over and over again as if they're something that we have to live by. And, you know, you can be super vocal about it, but are you as vocal about holding fast to God are you quick to say whatever that truth is, an actual truth when someone's going through something hard? So um, I had asked you all to, uh, on a little Facebook post, uh, to think of a verse or passage that uh, may encourage you um, when you're holding fast to God. If you all have that, uh, share that with the person that's next to you if you did not bring one that's fine. It was just something that if you were on Facebook, but that way it just gives you a way to just kind of uh, speak into that person's life in an encouraging way. So if you have that, then you can just share that with them at some point. So um, we should also look at the meaning of holding fast. So it's adhere to, embrace, to seize. This one really got me and I've read it over and over and over again to take possession of something that's already yours. 
And I just thought, oh yeah, it's not like you're just running out and grabbing a hold of something. You're taking possession of something that's already yours. And God's going to ask us as his followers to do some pretty crazy big things that aren't in um, our strength at all. And so if you're thinking in biblical terms, uh, sometimes it can be um, fixing your gaze. Sometimes it can be not losing sight. Um, it can be holding your position. And so you can look at all of these things and go, you know, is this what I'm doing with God in not only the good times, because that's easy, but also the times that are really challenging. So Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. So have you all ever been uh, swimming out in the ocean and you kind of go pretty far out and then you're whatever, you're kind of bobbing around and then all of a sudden you're like, where's the hotel? And you can't figure out where you are. Like the ocean's just kind of taken you on down and you just don't really have sight of where that is. Or you're trying to look for your beach chairs when you're in the ocean and or your towels or whatever or anything that looks familiar and you can't see it. And um, you can think of those terms, how it can be really disorienting if you're not fixing your gaze. Uh, another example is scuba diving. And sometimes that can be wildly disorienting. And, and a quick way to know the direction you're facing is what direction are the bubbles going? And so sometimes when you're like, wait, you have like that split second of panic, you know, you're like the bubbles are gonna go up. And so that allows you to kind of reorient your brain to know what direction you're supposed to go. Uh, also in the terms of maybe uh, you're a dancer or ice skating and you're spinning and spinning and spinning and they actually fix their gaze. And so those are just kind of thinking those terms. So uh, what are the first four words in the Bible? In the beginning. I was like, yeah. <laughs> like everyone goes in the beginning. <laughs> that was good. Right. So in the beginning, God. But it goes on in chapter 1 to say, and God, 24 times in that very first chapter. And the meaning of and is together with, along with, as well as, in addition to, including. It also says, so God, for this reason, therefore, with the aim, in order that. It also says, then God. Next, afterwards. Uh, some Bible translations may say then God instead of and God. And I found that when I was like looking through that uh, you can open up to Genesis 1 and look at chapter 1. And depending upon your translation, it just might say then God instead of and God on all of them. But when you're thinking together with, along with, as well as, for this reason, therefore, with the aim, in order that, all of a sudden you start putting those in terms of like, well, wait, God's doing things in my life. It's not just one thing or these things with, aren't without order. All of these things that seem and feel like chaos to me aren't really chaos. These are with the aim of, in order, together with, along with. There's more than just that one moment that we're living in those circumstances that we're feeling. So these sentences are showing God is someone that we can trust, we can have a relationship with, and God knew our name in the very beginning. We know that he knew our name. God knew what would and is will happen and will happen. And God said, and God said, and God made, and God saw, and God set, and God blessed, um, and God saw everything in the beginning, God. These are in conjunction and chronological. They're not in chaos. They're not by chance. They're in order and they're in control. Doesn't that sound like someone that's in control of our lives? But when we're in circumstances, we just lose all sight of that. We're going to take our eyes off what is hard and we'll hold on to what is. And that's him. Psalm 27, 13 through 14, 
I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage and wait for the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, when we feel overwhelmed, help us to remember you hold us fast. Thank you for faithfully doing this in spite of our faithfulness. We don't need to open the door to fear or be filled with discouragement when emotions or voices just seem so much louder. Our names are on your hands. We are before you. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. You will not forget us. Show us how and when to lay down and rest. Lead us to the places that offer quiet hope or bits of peace throughout our day. Lead us to righteous thoughts and living. I pray we stay ever near as you hold us. Remind us not to leave your side, no matter how dark, desolate, easy, or good our days may be. You are a sure place, a sure foundation, a savior in a shifting world. Hold us fast as we come quickly. We love you and thank you for allowing us this time to worship you. In your name I pray, amen. So uh, we all kind of uh, know the song Deep and Wide. I mean, every, does everybody know the song Deep and Wide? Just, okay, great. Um, no one wants to hear me sing. So uh, in that song, you know, it's like there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. Uh, but what is deepest in our hearts will go widest to the world. And so we have to remember that if we're holding on to what our understanding is in whatever tough moment, and we're spilling that fear out, and we're spilling those words of anxiety or tension or whatever, is that deeper in your heart than God's truths? So just whenever you're thinking of that song deep and wide, remember what's deepest in your heart is going to go widest to the world. Jesus is our safe place. Oh, my goodness, got a little bad cough. Mm. He's our mighty fortress, our protected place. He's unchanging. I'm finally going to put my glasses on. His purpose is unchangeable. It's impossible for God to lie. God's given his oath. So let's turn to 2 Corinthians 1, and we're going to read 3 through 4. So 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. Does anyone want to read it? I don't ever want to like steal that opportunity from someone. Okay, so I will. Uh, praise be to the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of, our, of compassion and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. I mean, isn't that verse comforting? But it also shows it's just we're not in this for just us alone. Like he's showing us comfort and then we need to go out and show that to other people. Christ is with us. It certainly doesn't mean things aren't hard. Our circumstances aren't for just us to endure, but for us to share Christ. We have to be mindful that the way we went through something may not be the way someone else is going through something. So you can go through what appears to be literally the exact same thing and even be present with someone and that person can experience it in a very different way. And we need to be mindful of that because even when we're telling someone, encouraging them, comforting them, whatever it is, the way they're going through something could be wildly different than the way you're going through it. Um, my we had an accident, a car accident when we were really young and uh, my mom and my dad and me all got hurt really bad and ended up in the hospital and uh, I was six and my sister was seven and I didn't know my parents were still alive and I didn't know my sister was alive and we're just all separated. And so I thought, oh, like my entire family's gone, you know, cause I'm six. So that's like, you don't even know how to articulate to a doctor, like, has my family passed? Like, you just don't even know like how to say something like that. I just was like, oh, so this is like my life now. 
And it wasn't until, and I got out of the hospital before my parents got out of the hospital. And it wasn't until the day I got out of the hospital that I realized that my family was still alive. <laughs> and so they willed me to the floor where my mom was first. And, uh, and then they willed me to my dad because I was in a wheelchair and uh, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, like imagine like the emotions, like everything, like not only is my mom alive, but now I'm getting ready to see her. And just as I go in, they turn the lights off. And so, you know, like I panicked because I was like, why would you turn the lights off if I could see everything? And so, you know, it was uh, lots of things, but then like you don't really necessarily have your mom to just be like, and now I'm gonna leave this hospital with you to like go through all of this. So I see my mom, I see my dad, I absorb all that. And then uh, I get willed out and I end up, uh, I think, because I don't know, because again, I'm six, um, I think, oh, I'm just gonna live with my aunt and uncle now. Like, that's just it, this is my life. Like, I live with them now, but then I get in the car and my sister's in the car and I'm like, surprise, surprise, my sister's alive. Like, I didn't even know she was alive because, you know, then they didn't allow children to come to the hospital and all that stuff. And so my sister and I both convinced ourselves that, you know, we live forever with our aunt and uncle and their two kids. But her experience, I, I have no idea what she did while we were in the hospital. I don't even know to this day. I don't even know who she I don't even know who she stayed with. Like I don't know anything about that time frame of what happened to her, but we went through the same experience and it's so f funny that we went through the same experience, but it was so incredibly different and then uh, it's the first time both of us had been in the car after that that accident and on that same road. And so uh, I guess our anxiety got the best of us. Um, and we both vomited all over the back of my uncle's new car. And um, so what's really funny is it's become like this joke in the family because they had had this new car for one week and my sister and I quickly made waste of it. Um, just from being so anxious. But, you know, again, you can go through the exact same experience. Like my uncle, he understood what the family went through, but he wasn't throwing up in the front seat, you know? And he's, it's like you can go through those same experiences even with tight family and not really know what they're experiencing in those moments and even decades later, decades and decades and decades later, you still don't know how that other person went through something. Like, I know what it was like to go through it as a six-year-old. I don't know what it was like to go through as a mom who separated from her children and also having injuries. Like, I don't know what that is. So we have to be careful that we're pointing people to the one sure thing that we do know and that's Christ. So my cousin, uh, Christy, the one that uh, we actually lived together at that accident, we, years ago, we worked together at a particular place and we did like really elaborate window displays. And uh, the way to see the window, you'd have to leave the building to go out and make sure everything was in place. So she would stay in and I would walk out and then, uh, Sometimes you'd want to get close to kind of tweak and then sometimes you'd realize you'd have to like go at a really far distance because, you know, sometimes it'd be like really elaborate window displays. And so I'd get out on the road and I'd get a little further and a little further and I would be like, and so she would try to fix it. And then I'd be like, mm -mm. and then, you know, you're like this, but then she's like this, this. And so eventually what you'd have to do is you'd have to get closer you'd get closer to the window. You'd get closer to try to explain. And I can't tell you how many times you'd have to just walk in and be like, I need for you to do this. Like, because you think that you're being so clear, but there's such a distance, like you can't hear. There's all these barriers from hearing and knowing what that really means. 
So we're told in James 4, 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Butchered that. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So when you draw near, you're going towards. You're not going away. Can you taste if something's good from a distance? I mean, you might kind of assume or maybe even possibly smell it if you're close enough to smell it. Um, Can you uh, see if something is good from a distance? No, because sometimes you can... uh, I watched this National Geographic special last night about the swallows in the Sahara Desert, and there is... um, this body of water that from a distance, it looks so pure and looks so clean. And these swallows have flown, I think they said it was 1,100 miles and that's the first time they hit water. And so then from a distance, it looks so clean, but then when you get close, it's just putrid. And if they drink that water, they will die. And they're in the salinity is much higher in that water, however, Here's what's interesting, is that the flies uh, drink the water and filter it through their systems. And if the swallows eat the flies, then they, that water has been filtered and that's how they will actually get the water. Isn't nature amazing? Like God is amazing that he does that. But it's like, again, from a distance, you're like, oh, that looks, I even thought that. I was like, oh my gosh, why is that water so clear? That water is so pure. And then they go on to explain, I was like, oh, I'm dumb. That's not, that, that water is not good. That is not clear water. That is, that is dangerous water of death. So, <laughs> right. But we're told to come close. But he's also, at the same time we're coming close, he's sending us out. We have a job to do. And we aren't given a list of reasons or excuses um, that we're like, oh, I'm absolved of that. I don't have to do that because I'm going through all of these things. He's sending us out, but he's telling us, I'm with you. We represent him to the world. As you walk through whatever trials you might go through, are you holding fast to him? What's deepest in your heart goes widest to the world. So turn to Isaiah 40. We're going to read 28 through 31. And if anyone wants to read it, you are more than welcome. Isaiah 40, 28 through 31. Do you know, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and his understanding and no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength And they will soar on the wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And then we're going to flip over to Isaiah 43. We're going to read 1 through 3. So 43, 1 through 3. But now this is what the Lord says. "He, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be buried. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Now, I'm reading from the NIV, and there are some... uh, Times I will flip back to the ESV. So like if you're like, that didn't exactly match mine. It's the NIV. Um, so uh, if all we say is, oh, I have a plan and I trust it, that's true. You know, or God has a plan and I trust it. That's true. But um, just having a plan doesn't mean that just equals trust. Like, oh, God has a plan. So therefore, it's just 100% easy for me to trust him. We can't just say, just because he has a plan, I trust it. People need to hear you say this, but people also need to hear you say, do not fear, for I am with you. People need to hear, do not be anxious, for I am your God. People need to see us open our Bibles and read Isaiah 41.10. 
So let's open our Bibles and read Isaiah 41.10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Could you imagine the conversations, even to an unbeliever, that that could open up? Uh, Pat Nicholas stopped me at one time because you all know I would rather eat glass than stand in front of people and speak. Like it's so incredibly hard for me. It's just 100% God that allows me to st stand here and my legs don't buckle. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it's funny because right before I was teaching one of the classes, she was in the hallway and uh, she said, you know, is everything okay? And I was like, oh yeah, I'm just taking a moment. I'm getting ready to go in there and teach class. She didn't say, can I pray for you? She grabbed my hands and she goes, let's pray. And just immediately started praying. And it was like one of those moments where you're like, core memory has now formed. But, you know, like we all have those moments where you're just like, this is forever in my brain. Because how many times have you said, I will pray for you to someone, and then you kind of walk away? And you mean it, but you just kind of say it and then walk away. Or, um, you know, you're, you're just kind of going through the motions. You might even forget to pray. Um, and... I just think the fact that she just grabbed a hold of me and didn't even ask my permission. She just was like, I'm doing this right now. This is the right thing. So when we see someone going through something, to have those verses ready to just infuse that in and just say, I'm going to pray for you right now. And honestly, the more you do it, the easier it becomes. At work, I just made a decision. I'm just going to start being bold and a little crazy and just start inviting everyone to church. Like, I'm just going to start just doing that. And it's funny because I've been there for 12 years. But I'm just going to be like, oh, you know, I know that you know I go to church, blah, blah, blah. And it's not in this same county that we live in and work in. But I just want you to know you're invited, whatever it is. And I think just even um, today's a new day. It's a new month. It's October 1st. Just starting that new moment of opening that doorway to start having conversations that maybe you haven't even had in the past. And then maybe that person that's going through something you know about or doesn't know about could be like, oh, wait, they go to church. Because that's amazing how many people that, I don't want to say, they believe in God that he exists, but they don't necessarily believe in him as their savior. But when something bad happens, everybody wants prayers. Everybody knows, oh, you're the person that I'm going to come to and I'm going to ask for prayers. But are you the person that they're coming to and saying, I need him every day. I need him every day. I need for him to help me decide what do, do I need to get in the car and uh, run to the grocery right now? Or should I stay at home and be with my family? Or do I need to take that vacation? Or is this how I need to spend my money? Am I stewarding my home really well? Whatever it is, it's like really just it's a new day. Just open that door right up and just start inviting people to church. Start uh, reading these verses of comfort to them. Uh, maybe you have even have something that's on your desk at work that just is like now all of a sudden it's like a little calendar with Bible verses. Uh, I started putting one in the office and it's funny because everyone would stop every day and stop and grab it and read it. And no one else goes to church in the office. But they would stop and read it every day. So whatever way you can infuse that into people's daily lives. Maybe leave them a little post-it note with a little encouragement. Just being like, I don't know, I just thought of you. This may be, you know, and it's just a, don't put on there, you know, just the Bible verse, Isaiah 43, one through three, Kelly loves you. Like, don't just write that, actually write the verse out for them so they can hold on to that truth and go, wait, what is this? There's something more to that. So, He's telling us his word is a healing balm. Show people that you're disciplined in your faith. Live in light of eternity, not for tomorrow or the next school break or whatever it is. And there's going to be things that happen today and tomorrow and the next week that hurt and hinder us. And they're just like straight up hard. 
but we have to live for something that's so much greater than those moments. And if we aren't giving people Christ, all we're doing is just kind of sympathizing with people. And that's not what we want to do. So when someone says, my life is a mess, how would you respond? Give people the truth about Jesus. Have that ready. I, I mean, has anyone ever had someone say, oh my gosh, my life is just a mess? Yeah, I've even said that. Like, I've been the one, and I have heard people say that. Be ready to offer that encouragement in the truth that God gives us. Give clear examples in Scripture that point these to these truths. There's going to be probably in this room a dozen different needs um, with a lot of different circumstances leading up to them. And we're all different going into those circumstances. But he is the same to all of us. And he is going to be the same to everyone that we encounter. So instead of saying, oh, God is enough, he has a plan, that can kind of start to sound like it's a little cliche instead of it being a truth. So what we need to do is, again, we need to make sure that we're speaking those truths into people's lives. So turn to uh, Psalms 55. Psalm 55, and we're going to read verse 22. So Psalm 55, 22, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. It matters how you explain and share Christ with people. So long before you intentionally share Christ with people, you are sharing Christ with people. You just are. Long before you intentionally decide to do anything, you have already started sharing him with people. Because the moment that they realize you're a believer, you're a Christ follower, I hope that's the exact moment that they meet you. And if it isn't, there are some additional questions. <laughs> but they should know that, that you are sharing Christ long before you probably are sharing Christ with people. And so the way that you speak about this is important, that he's going to hold us fast in his strength, his power, his knowledge, his justice. I have grabbed a hold. I have taken possession of something that was already mine. And that's why I can go through these things because of Christ. So who does God help in the Bible? He helps the blind. He helps the deaf. He helps the paralyzed, the dumb, the greedy. And some of us fall into these categories when our, when our faith is tested and we live this way. Because God gave us free will, we choose to not look for him in circumstances. We choose to not hear the Holy Spirit whisper in our ear. We choose to do nothing and remain still when we should go. We choose to remain ignorant because we followed our bliss. We did what made us happy, not what honored Christ. Again, deep and wide. What's deepest in our heart will go widest to the world. We choose to be frugal with our words and our deeds and our resources, but we limit them to our own understanding and abilities. Like we hold on to these things just because we're like, oh, I don't have enough time to do this, so my time's going to be for X, Y, and Z, or I don't feel like I have enough money, so I'm going to hold on to that because, you know, I need to do X, Y, and Z. And that is being fiscally responsible, but there still is... You know, it's always remarkable to me. And, you know, there's a lot of times where people are like, oh, I don't have money as they're holding like a new iPhone with their nails done and their eyebrows did. And, uh, you know, whatever it is, you know, it's like they have all of that. And you're just like, oh, so there's money, you know, for your Mountain Dew, but there's not money for deeds or whatever. So, again, we are trusting God that we are holding on to him and what he promises. He's going to give us exactly what we need. He's giving us our daily bread. He's not telling you to be like, Amelia, I need for you to worry about five years from now when you are making this decision. Uh, I need for you to really be focused on that. I, I'm giving you what you need today. And who knows? I mean, I don't know about anybody in this room, but, you know, 
certain things that I thought would happen in the last five years were never on my radar. Never even occurred to me that what has happened over the last five years could ever happen. And so it's, uh, it, you get your daily bread and, and it is enough. So turn to Matthew 11, 28 through 30. I'm going to start reading. <clears throat> 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So at work, I've said this to you all before, so I apologize for the repeat. Uh, we are instructed to speak to people at the beginning uh, at a third grade level. Uh, I work in an advanced care provider system, and so there's a lot of terminology and things that are said to patients that uh, a lot of patients that come to us in the year 2023 will say, I'm sorry, I can't read. I can't write. I don't know how to spell this. They come from entirely different circumstances than probably most of us in this room. And so you have to backtrack and think, how do I say these terms in ways that someone's going to really understand? How do I explain this test when their anxiety is going to be high? And there's one test that's done that is a pulmonary function test. And I always tell people, it's really funny. I'm like, it's like you're getting in a kitchen cabinet <laughs> and then they're telling you to breathe in and then blow, 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 blow. And then they're like, oh, okay. And you know, I want it to take the test just so I could easily explain it to patients. It really is like getting in a kitchen cabinet, by the way. Um, but what we have to do when we hear terms like yoked, that can be a really weird word for someone who isn't a believer and in the word to hear. Like they would just be like, oh, that's one of those church words. And they just instantly shut you off. So you have to start going back and thinking, how would I explain that to someone? And LifeWay did a study in 2022, and it said that 68% of people seldom or never went to church. Now, granted, this is their study. It's not, it's not showing that it's, they didn't, you know, it didn't go out with the last census. <laughs> so it's not every person in America saying this, but I think it's a great snapshot. 68% of people that they surveyed said they seldom or never went to church. 32% went monthly and 18% went weekly. So the general population no longer has an idea of all the terms that maybe we grew up just knowing because we heard great-grandparents, grandparents, parents, whatever saying. So when you're saying yoked, you're like, well, well what, what is that? Think like um, an umbilical cord. Most people know what an umbilical cord is. And you can go from there. You can be like, you know, how this gives life to the child. So you're thinking in terms of like, speaking to someone like a third grader. And as you understand where they are in understanding, you can build from there. So when you're infusing into someone's life to hold fast, don't use all your churchy words because that can be really uh, off-putting. You know, just saying, well, we have a sovereign God. You, you can't trust that someone even knows what that means. And so... That I was listening to this uh, podcast and it was really funny because um, they were like, oh, name words that you once said that were incorrect and now you're embarrassed about. And this person uh, read something and they said, sovereign, sovereign. And they kept saying it and no one knew what they were talking about. And it wasn't, it, it wasn't um, you know, a church podcast. It wasn't anything like, it wasn't Bible-based and that person had no idea. And them reading that word as an adult, like a grown up, they didn't even know how to pronounce the word. And so then they were like, what are you trying to say? And then when they said it, other people in the room had to explain to that person even what that meant. So we have to go back and make sure that we're explaining to people what that means. Has anyone in here ziplined before? 
Um, did you enjoy it? My mom forced me to do it. She bought the tickets and then didn't ask me if I wanted to do it. She said, you will do this. And so that's why I ziplined because she told me to. Uh, but when you go, you're strapped in. You would not do it if your survival depended upon your grip strength. If they were like, I need for you to go from this side over this thousand feet in the air or 600 feet in the air or wherever you are, if you weren't, you know, belayed in and had any safety equipment whatsoever, would you do it? If they were like, this depend if you don't hold on, you're going to plummet to your death. I mean, I would argue that no one would do it. And um, so what you can even explain to people when you're talking about holding fast, talk about zip lining. You can be like, we're belayed in. And if someone doesn't know what belayed in, you can explain. We, we have our safety is clipped in. And then when that safety fails, there's another one. And then when things get, you know, I'm not one of those. Uh, if I zip line, my hands are not coming off of like the little, no, I'm not one of those that's like, whoa, like, are you all? Yeah, are you? Okay, um, so I mean, I'm one of those that I have like the death grip, like as I'm, even though I know like I, the safety, I'm clipped in, I'm holding on for dear life. So use those as an examples when you're telling people and make it um, approachable and you can get into the truths that way. So this is not a complete list because everyone is gonna be in different circumstances with different experiences leading up to these circumstances. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna hit on some areas of holding fast to God. And those are just applied because again, we're all different, all different circumstances, but God's the same. God, we're all, we're changing and different and God is the same and he's the same for everybody. So these will apply to whatever the situation is, whether it's a doctor's appointment, whether it's a diagnosis, whether it's infertility, whether it's anxiety over classes and just school feeling like too much, uh, whatever it is, they apply because God's the same to everybody. So again, not a complete list. So we can hold fast by trusting God's promises. So I read this quote, God is picking on me. He is picking on me to personally live out one of his promises. Like, have you ever been in a situation you're like, I really need a break? Like, God, it would really be great if I could, ju if just a little slack, like now would be a great time. I, f I feel like you're picking on me. You know, is there any other student you can go to right now? <laughs> So it's that type that he's picking on me to personally live out one of his promises, but it doesn't always feel that way. He could be equipping us for something and he's working while we're waiting. So when we're going through all of this, if all we're focused on is the way that we're feeling, we're not going, there's probably something God's doing in me right now that he's either gonna use, that I need to learn, whatever it is, and I need to trust God's promises. Well, where do you go for God's promises? I mean, yeah, you, you go to him in prayer. You go to him in what he gives to us. So how do we do this? We, we hold fast patiently. Psalm 37, 7. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. That is hard. Uh, I can get ahead a lot of times. I can be like, oh, oh, I know what you're doing here. I know what's next. I don't know, is anybody else that way? Like, it's just like, oh, I, I see where this is going. So then like, I'll just jump in because I feel like I know what this is. Um, so we need to be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Psalm 41, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me and heard me cry. There can be patience within the day-to-day, week-by-week, month-by-month, and year-to-year as we wait. We also are going to do it quietly. Psalm 62, 5. I wait quietly before God, for my hope is in Him. 
saying less is often best. I mean, we were talking earlier about like as soon as class started about report cards and just how you know often it can be like, oh, she talks too much. She doesn't keep her mouth shut. That hasn't changed for me. So I mean, you know, like just waiting quietly. Sometimes what we say to people can have the wrong impression of God. And sometimes keeping our mouth shut is the best thing we can do until we're assured that it's the right thing to say that he would have us say. Um, expectantly, we're holding fast expectantly. Psalm 105.5, I wait expectantly, trusting God to help, for he has promised. You should feel eager, not anxious, that God will come through, even if it's not in the way or the time that you expect. So the second thing, hold fast to the power of God's plan and not your own. So you hold fast to the power of God's plan. In Genesis 37 through 47, we see Joseph's story unfold for approximately 22 years but we repeatedly see honoring God throughout really crummy circumstances. I'm somebody that I really like resolve and I wanna see things wrapped up and moved on. That's just kinda of who I am. Um, that's kinda of the opposite of the way life happens and the way the Lord works, 22 years. So you can be in some horrible situation and it's taking years. That season is just really long. And it's just taking years and years to unfold. God is with us in those circumstances. We also need to watch out for bad advice. James 1.5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all who finding fault and it will be given to you. We need to be careful that we're not giving bad advice, but we also need to make sure that we're not receiving bad advice. And how do you do that? Well, you get in the word. You ask God for wisdom. Because sometimes what someone can tell you sounds right, but there's like that little thing inside that goes, something was just a little off with that. Like I need to dig a little deeper. So uh, God's timing and our timing are rarely the same. So when we're trusting God, the power and his plans, we're trusting that the length of time that he's taking, it's the right amount of time. And even though it doesn't feel right to us, it's the right amount of time. The third thing is we hold fast because we see what life with and without God is like as a reminder and a warning. Well, where do you see that? And where do you have all of these examples? You have it in here. So again, when you're going through something, or you're speaking into someone's life, you can look up those references. We uh, This class originally was supposed to be a longer class and everything kept getting uh, switched up and switched up and changed. And then it was just like, um, okay, it's a one shot. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so there is no way that we could cover like all the topics that we wanna cover. So what we're doing is using these things as an overlay to go. This is kind of like a 30,000 foot view of holding fast and you're gonna use those in whatever situations, experience or circumstances and you're gonna get in the word and find those true examples and share a true God with people and yourself as a reminder. So in Ecclesiastes 1, 13 and 14, it says, <clears throat> I applied my mind to study to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Pursuing a relationship with the Lord is to live from the hand of God and it leads to joy and harmony. Throughout Ecclesiastes, we see living without God, everything under the sun on on earth, under heaven, an existence filled with pain and toil and sadness and being disillusioned. Doesn't that kind of feel like the world right now? Um, our hearts were created to worship God, but because of the fall, we have selfish habits that we're just gripped by sin and distractions and uh, our own desires. We can look at the Garden of Eden as this, like with and without God. 
how everything was perfect. And then instantly they, this is what life is without God. Like just like changes so quickly without God. Ecclesiastes is a look inside of man, his heart and his brain and what was observed. And so when you read that, you just feel that tension. I like to read Ecclesiastes out loud. It just feels so powerful when you're reading it out loud because you just, you feel that tension and that trust and that turmoil. And when you're reading those words out loud, they just, they, I don't know, they become so real. Uh, so the fourth thing is we hold fast because we're followers of the Lord and the leading of the Lord. So Exodus 13, 21, it says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they may travel by day and by night. Can you imagine how reassuring that must have been? I mean, you can see that. God made a way to communicate his presence. I've often had this visual where sometimes I want, you know, like when you go to those uh, games, like whatever type of game, those big foam fingers, you know, that you can get at a, at a ball game. Like, I want one of those to come down from the sky and be like, Jennifer, this way. You know, like, I, I want the big foam finger to, like, point the direction and make it so easy for me and have that clear direction. God made a way to communicate his presence. Fire at night and smoke during the day, the people in the way, way back could see the pillar or the cloud of smoke and know that's their beacon. God himself supernaturally made those for the Israelites to follow. He gave us his word. And what does it mean when you give someone your word? You're making a promise. And a promise is a promise. Like you can't break a promise. Psalm 1830. So again, Psalm 1830. This God... His way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. Is this your major struggle? If it is, study his word. Look for those examples. If you struggle with just taking refuge in him, then be near him. <laughs> if you're struggling with taking refuge, stop running the other way. Like, start running towards instead of away. He will go before you and be with you. Maybe it's a listening or obedience in his listening. And we tell our children uh, or children in our lives, delayed obedience is disobedience. That isn't obedience. And so the same thing applies for us as adults. Like, we need to do what he's telling us to do right now. So the fifth thing, we hold fast because our focus is on the here and now because tomorrow isn't promised. So let's turn to Haggai 2, 3 through 5. Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? Who do you see... Uh, how do you see it now? It is not as nothing is, I can't read. Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong. O Zerubbabel uh, declares the Lord, be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of the host. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. How many of us can relate to looking at former glory of what was and looking at what is as nothing special or just worse? I mean, have you all just looked at what once was? I mean, we're all in uh, different seasons of life. And so you can even just look at, you know, if you're someone that's in college, like, oh, I used to like the structure of going class to class. And, you know, even though you might not admit it, like having my parents force me to do my homework, you know, it can be, uh, I liked it when I didn't have to pay a mortgage. Um, 
<laughs> you know, it can be whatever the season of life is. You're just like, you can look back at those times. Like I liked it when I didn't lose so much hair. I liked it when I didn't have hot flashes. You know, like I can look back and go, I didn't know that those things happened because I wasn't experiencing those things. The Lord did not stop the people from honoring the past. He did urge them to not neglect the present. So we can still honor the past. We can't neglect what's happening today. The temple before was opulent and beautiful. The elderly people remembered what their eyes had seen. The new temple would be less magnificent to the eye, but would be much more important because it'd provide a place of worship and would revitalize God's community. So sometimes what you're seeing, even though it might not look as good or as pretty or as profitable or whatever it is, it doesn't mean that it isn't good or profitable. It just means that it's different today. And there might even be a different, greater purpose to something being less than. So uh, the sixth thing is uh, hold fast by trusting God with our finances. Uh, last week, if you all were in Herschel's Sunday School class, he talked about advance on November 5th, and that's giving to the uh, building fund. And he had asked all of us to go home and faithfully discuss and pray, uh, depending upon what your circumstances are. It might be with your family. Um, it might be just going to the Lord yourself, whatever it is. He wants you to really faithfully consider how you can contribute to um, the building fund and getting this paid off. And trusting God with our finances can be so incredibly hard and it can get harder the older you get because the more fixed your income feels and there's a greater urgency because there's, oh, I need X amount of money to retire or I need this or I need that. And you're trying to get all of those things in line that you might not think of when you're, you know, 18, 28 or even 38. And so the older you get, the way you think about money can be incredibly different than the way you may have thought about it at 18 or, or 20 years old. So let's turn to Malachi 3. We're going to read 8 through 10. So 8 through 10. <clears throat> Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, have, have we robbed you in your tithes and contributions? You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and therefore, or thereby, put me to the test. So the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. God commanded the Israelites to give tithes to celebrate God's abundant provision to support the Levites, and to provide for the poor. We have to remember that uh, when we're giving, it's also showing that our faith isn't private. And I'm not saying that you would be like, dear Facebook people, guess how much I gave to the building fund. I'm not saying that at all. Um, but our faith isn't private. And when we are giving money to our church, we are doing like displaying a social faith by saying this the people in the church matter, and although the building isn't the church, the building matters. How many events have we had in this building where it had nothing to do with our church? We've had the state police. We've had schools come here for school programs. This building is such an important way to reach people in the community because when that moment comes that someone's speaking into their lives or... Uh, a challenge comes up or whatever, they may think, oh, I went to Buck Run for that. I remember going to that church. And if for no other reason, they would come here simply because they've been here before and they remember how to get here. So this building really matters for ways that we can reach people that are unbelievers. So uh, we need to make sure that we are, as Dr. York asked us to, really faithfully considering what we can contribute to that advance fund on November 5th. 
um, the seventh thing, holding fast means taking God at his word. Our hope is an anchor. When God makes a promise, we can have total confidence that he will fulfill his vow. But remember, God's working in his time. We have uh, so many faith-building, agonizing examples of faithfully and not so faithfully waiting on the Lord. And it can be agonizing and it can be hard. And we need to make the decision, are we going to draw near or are we going to draw away? Are we going to focus on whatever that circumstance is? Like it has been a one crazy summer, hasn't it, Mother? So I'm going to say that and try not to cry. It has been a crazy, crazy summer. So we have to focus on building our faith, but also sharing that faith with others in spite of our circumstances. And we have opportunities in rest stops along the way, in hotels that we may stay in, in waiting rooms that we may stay in, and nursing stations that we stop at, just to share Christ and who he is. We don't know how God's gonna use those, but it's our job to share him. So the eighth thing, when we hold fast, we're reminded God is with us. Turn to Deuteronomy 8. We're going to read uh, five verses, 1 through 5. Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 5. I'm going to read it real fast, sorry. The whole commandment that I command you today, you shall, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to the fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that, gosh, sorry, this gets me, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, that man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, your clothing did not wear out on you, and your foot did not swell these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. He cares about the tiniest little details. He cares about the food. He cares about the shoes that you wear. He cares about your clothes. God is with us when we're in those waiting rooms. He's also, he's with us when we're in the, it's never going to happen room. I've been there. I never got to have kids. Every post of like, oh, it's daughter day, crushes me. Every post of, oh, it's Sunday, crushes me. Mother's Day, crushes me. Like every baby shower invite, crushes me. You know, it's just like, yet I'm overjoyed in the same breath for everyone that has that. So you have to sit there and go, he's with me in that waiting room, but he's also in that room of like, it's just not gonna happen. That just wasn't, this wasn't how this was gonna work for you. And I trust him in that. The last thing is we're holding fast and it demonstrates their strength through weakness. So strength through weakness. Second Corinthians 12, seven through 10. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul's thorn is our hardship, just fill in the blank, whatever that hardship is. It wasn't a quick bout with something and it was over and done. It was constant. God used the thorn to teach him and us about sufficiency in his grace. This thorn made Paul rely on God even more. We need to fix our gaze on Christ in spite of our circumstances. We're called to hold fast to our faith without wavering. Let us be reminded of the faithfulness of God. 
and what he's done for us. And I encourage you all to just hold fast with an unwavering hope. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, you've called us to shine the light of Christ in this world. Help us to hold and not hide our faith in you. Let us be quick to share and bold to speak and not look for offense. This world is so broken and at times for some it just feels like it's just too much to bear. Be our stronghold. Gird us up with your promises, your presence, your promises, your purpose. Let our words speak with reverence and awe of what you are doing in and through our lives today. Use our lives as you will to bring others to you in worship and praise. Please be with the pastor as he brings the message today. And let today be the day that many will hear the answer that, of you calling their name. And they, they, they answer the call. They say, yes, Lord, I'm, I'm accepting you as my Savior. Thank you for patiently and tender love, tenderly loving us. Help us to better learn to hold on to you and to you alone. In your name I pray, amen.